Hey everybody, Bob Babbitt. Day two of Breakfast of Bob from the New York City Marathon. We are presented by Polar, sponsored by You Can and Babbittville Radio. Our next guest, the king of the burrito, Mr. Scott Fobble. Scott, how you doing? Uh, I'm amazing. I'm better now that you said that. I don't know that I can quite claim king of the burrito. That's it's such a big, big claim. Burritos are so important to so many people. If I'm I, I'd be happy to just be royalty. Burrito you are royalty. royalty. Is fine. You yeah. are definitely yeah. royalty. The Duke of the Burrito would be fine. The Duke of the yeah. Burrito, or the, like the the uh, second prince, whatever. Prince of the Burrito is good. The I like that. The, the prince, prince of the Burrito. Of yeah, I think that. Works I don't think well. I'm. I don't think I'm the king. I don't no. want to put myself there yet. I bet you there there's isn't... always someone else bigger than you. You know. Yeah, but not anybody who's run two oh nine ten. No, for I, the marathon, yeah. <laughs> right? Who's run that at Boston? Yes, yeah, that's, that's a little different. I'll say the king of the Burrito. For 209 marathoners. I'll take that. Okay. Yeah. So running 209, yeah. talk a little bit about how special that was, especially doing it in Boston. Yeah, I mean, it was awesome. Boston is an amazing event, super historic, uh, awesome course, awesome crowds, awesome fans. Um, and so to have a big day there means a lot to me. And it's, you know, New York is awesome, obviously. Uh, and it's got you know, a very awesome energy, and now having run well at Boston, it's got a very special place in my heart, and I'll yeah. I'll go back there every year that I can. Every year it makes sense. So, so last year was New York, and what, 212? Yeah, 212, 28, seventh yes. place. Yeah, seventh place, yeah. and that th th did that change things for you in terms of the awareness of who you are and what you do? No, I don't. I don't think so. I think I was I was always confident that I could do something like that, and um, I don't think it would have changed my vision of myself. Whether I would have run 212 or 209 or uh, 227, like right. I feel like I'm the same person, no matter how it goes on the course. But when you run, I hope so, at least. when you finish seventh, yeah, right, and when mm -hmm. you finish seventh in a, in a field like this, that changes other people's perception of who you are and what you can accomplish. From there to Boston, take me through what what changed in terms of your training, or was it just okay? I, I've gotten to a point where I'm I'm really really good. Mm -hmm. How do I get to that next level? Yeah, it was kind of the second one. Like we didn't didn't change anything, didn't revamp uh, any of the training. If anything, we kind of just did more of the same and made little tweaks here and right. there. So, um, just kind of doubled down on what we knew worked, and um, things were really condensed before Boston. We kind right. of put all the marathon specific workouts right next to each other, and um, we pushed the envelope a couple times in some big workouts and. Then there were some other ones that we bat we dialed back. So uh, we didn't we didn't change anything big. It was just about um, just about doing more of the same, doing know what we knew worked, and sticking to the program. So take me back to training up in Oregon, and I think it was Friday nights where you that's where the burrito started, yeah. right? Where everything started, and we're talking the birth of the burrito, November twenty eighth, two thousand seventeen, bur the birth of the burrito mafia. Yeah. But uh, the University of Portland is where everything started. Yeah, yeah. University of Portland is where everything started. So every day, every Friday, yes. at the end of the week, we'd always have a hard workout. And then we would, um, my the, all the, everyone on the team. So no matter what year in the class you were, who your kind of group within the team was, everyone was invited to go to Burrito Azteca. And we'd go there every single Friday. We always made sure everyone had a ride. Um, it was very, very inclusive. And we would just go and we'd... Sit down at Burrito Azteca, you get your burrito, and you just shoot the shit with right. just these guys. It doesn't. We didn't have to talk about running. Sometimes it was girls. Sometimes it was school. Sometimes it was sports. It didn't matter. Right. And uh, that was really important to me. Those those were some of my favorite nights in all college. Was just hanging out with my best friends, and we just always happened to be eating burritos. And uh, that also coincided with kind of the like birth of not the birth of Twitter, but like when I joined Twitter and realized that this was just a stand-up comedy yes. routine for me. Absolutely. Yeah, this, I'm not I'm not a political analyst. I'm not a sports analyst. These are jokes. This is for me to have fun. Yeah. It's and, a way to relax. Yep. It's a way to blow off steam after what you guys do is very hard. Yeah, and uh, so every time we went, I would just make a joke about eating a burrito. Right. And as I got faster, as I gained more followers, um, the burrito thing really... Uh, it really took hold, and it really started to snowball. And so uh, we got this following of people tweeting burrito pictures of me and um, liking all these burrito tweets. And so, you know, in 2017, whenever I wrote that, was yes. uh, it was kind of like, hey, like, let's get this a little bit organized. Like, let's 
answer some questions that everyone's been asking me about like how it started, what the point is, and um, I'll just be like, hell yeah, burritos, you know? And since then, it's yeah. been awesome. What's your, what was your go-to burrito on the Friday nights? I would either go, I would either go uh, chicken Azteca burrito yes. with a carne, or with a, sorry, with a chili relleno in it. And so here's the thing, if you go to a burrito place enough times, you can just ask them to do things for you and they'll almost always do it. Sure. And that's not like there was a chili reno burrito with chicken on the menu. And so the first time I asked for that, the guy was like, I don't know how much to charge you. And I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't really, really care. care. Yeah. <laughs> like you can't get 50 cents, a yeah. dollar, whatever like, you want. Whatever you want. It's fine. Whatever you think is fair, I'm paying it. I've made my decision this way. I'm, I'm not taking out a loan for this. Yeah. So uh, it was chicken, chicken with chili reno, or I would, I'd go breakfast burrito a lot. The, yeah. The machaca breakfast burrito was huge. Even in the evening? Even in the evening. Oh. There's really no... T um, no, no. It doesn't have... Breakfast can be any... Yeah. Well, listen. We're doing our breakfast show. It's noon. Yeah. Breakfast with Bob. It doesn't and, matter. And frankly, I like that we're doing the breakfast show at noon. One of my big pet peeves is restaurants that serve breakfast but not all day. It is. It just really bothers me. Breakfast is an all-day thing. Yeah. Because it's not like at 11.01, all your eggs disappear. No. Like, sorry, I know you've got a bunch of eggs. I know you've got bacon. I know you can still whip up a pancake or two. I'm a paying customer, and this is kind of what I would like. So I'm very for breakfast all times of yes. the day, breakfast burritos at all times of the day. Lunch should Lunch. be whenever you want. Yeah. Dinner, I mean, it's, it's my meal. Your deal. Yeah. You decide when. It, so, but you were getting to the point where you go into the same burrito place three times a week. Yeah. And parents were like, what, the, somebody steal your card here? What's going on? Yeah. You know, these guys were starting to take them yeah. as a dependent because yeah. <laughs> you're you're basically spending your all your college money on burritos. Yeah. I think I uh, probably paid the mortgage on Mario's house for a couple of years there. And so you yeah. became a, you, you become a treasured friend. Yeah, I'm uh, very good friends, or I was very good friends with Mario. Um, his One of his main guys, the bartender, was Leo. Yes, oh, Leo. Yeah, yeah Leo. He, he's the one where you yeah. guys were out oh, staying yeah. up a little late, drinking a little bit. He offered to let you stay there. He did, yeah. And he was a... Uh, yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> we were there, we were drinking at, at Burrito Azteca, and... Um, now it's Saturday. It was Friday yeah. night, and now well, it's like mid-Saturday. Well, when we were there, an ice storm rolled in. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so you couldn't leave. We couldn't leave, and so... We were just like, all right, we'll just wait it out. Like, yeah. the plows will come. Think about Portland. They don't have plows. No. They're just like, the city, su city shuts down. And so Leo's like, you know, we've all had plenty of drinks. and We're Leo, not driving home. I'm not driving home, of course. And Leo is like, uh, do you guys just want to crash in the upstairs apartment? And we're like, we've made it. Now we've really made it. <laughs> we're part of the family. Yeah. And after that night, like... For the next year and a half or so, uh, every time we'd go to Brito Azteca, if we went over to the bar where Leo was, yes. anytime we'd close out, he would just bring a shot of tequila with the, with the bill. With your bill? Yeah. yeah sort it was of just like, off the bill. It was like, hey, This is for you out. guys. He'd usually pour himself one, too. I really feel close to Leo. Like, I was... I should... Like, I really want him in my wedding. I think he's probably... Absolutely. I don't know if he's family. the best man. I haven't talked to him a ton in the last year and a half. Would he cater? Years. Would he cater the wedding? I would never ask him of that. He has too much responsibility <laughs> as the, the party guy. Yeah. You just want him to come and be at the table. I do, yeah. I would, yeah. I want, I want Leo in my life. Yeah, you don't I want Leo it. to be I need it. thinking need it. about all the burritos getting made. You of want him to not. be enjoying himself. No, no, no. Now, have you found anything equivalent in Arizona? Um... You know, since turning pro, I, I spend less time in bars. What? Uh, unfortunately, but um, <laughs> but no, I don't know that. Uh, like what one of the the defining characteristics of those nights was the sense of community, and yes. so as a professional, like obviously, I'm very close with all my teammates. But right. It's a it's different. Like we're adults. A lot of my teammates have kids. We don't all live in a two-block radius. What? I know. It's crazy. <laughs> You're not in one dorm with bunk beds? No. College ended. <laughs> and uh, I, think, I think it was the introduction of taxes into my life. Oh. And I was like, you know, this college lifestyle, uh, it, it just had to change. Yes. Um, just because that's how life works. And um, so, yeah, unfortunately, that sort of part of my life isn't such a staple, but... Whenever we do, whenever I get together with all those friends from college yeah. and go out, it's still, you know, it's the same. And we can just pick off. Well, pick you've been up. up there training lately, right? You've been up for, for a couple of weeks yeah. up in Portland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not training a ton, taking a little bit of downtime, yes. uh, relaxing right before this big buildup for the trials. Okay, speaking of the trials. Yeah, let's trials, trials coming up. Let's talk so, trials. Let's talk trials. All right. We're in Atlanta. Yep. The, have you gone out to check out what the course is going to be? No, we have a trip uh, for a few of us are scheduled for... 
uh, later in November. Okay. Yeah. To do a little reconnaissance. That's check right. the thing out. Yep. Like it. Of course, you've got to find burrito shops along the way. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I got it for after the race. Particularly, well, even on the race course will be great. I, I really feel like I get an energy from those those places. Of course you do. Yeah, they push me. They push me. I, I see them and I'm just like, I'm going to be my best self today for so the burrito place. From this, from tomorrow, it's mm -hmm. what 17 weeks of trials. Something Some, like that. Yeah. Something. Okay. And this is obviously you, you want to go to Tokyo. Yeah. Well, Sapporo now. They they moved the course. Oh, that's yeah, right. It's in Sapporo. That's better. It'll well, be a little it, cooler. Uh, yeah, I mean, for like the actual enjoyment of the race, I think it's better for the athletes. But uh, it's 650 miles away, you know. Like, so, there's a certain energy. I think I've never been to the Olympics, but I would imagine that there's a certain energy there. Of course, um, it would be really cool. Like, uh, on like one of the days when you're just hanging out before the race to be able to go to a men's volleyball game or uh, so a swim meet or. You know, whatever, one of the days, um, so which it, doesn't seem yeah. like it'll be a possibility, not especially given that the men's marathon's on the last day. It is a last day, yeah. so you might not even get to much of the Olympic festivities, or would you go for the opening ceremonies? And you we got to make it see. there. We got to make it there first. Make Bob. it there we'll first. Figure that oh, out. Okay, we'll figure, figure that out, out after Atlanta. After yeah. Atlanta, don't want to jump ahead too far. Yeah, we got to make it. We haven't okay. we haven't booked the flights yet. Okay, so but for Atlanta, you're going to go do some reconnaissance. Yep. And what do you know of the course at this point in terms of hilly, flats? Yeah, it's going to be really hilly. Um, I think there is like 1,300 feet of drop in over the course and just as much gain. Right. So it's basically the same as Boston. Boston has about 1,300 yeah. feet of drop in well, it. You like and that? Yeah, it went, it went pretty well. <laughs> um, but it will be condensed. Like the, the drops will be steeper. They'll be more constant because you have to make it. You have to go all the, do all the ups too. Right. Yeah. Uh, so... Getting to, in terms of the buildup that you'll do, will you stay in Arizona throughout that buildup? We'll see. Um, we're going to look at kind of the long-term forecast as it gets closer, and we might do a hot weather training trip if it looks like it's going to be unseasonably warm. But um, Usually, end of February in yeah. Atlanta shouldn't be that hot. Yeah, like... It could be cold. So, looking, yeah, looking historically, it looks like about 70% of the time, it's very, very nice weather. Yes. And 30% of the time, it's hot and hot. And uh, we want to make sure that we're doing everything right and give ourselves the best shot to make the team. So if it looks like it's going to be hot, we're going to go go train in hot weather. But yeah, that's uh, that's a long ways off. How important has it been being in Arizona with a, with a group? Right, mm -hmm. back in the day when American distance running was sort of falling off the cliff, people were all training in little silos on their own. You guys, as, as part of the, your North, Northern Arizona team, is is that been? How important has that been to your maturation as a runner? I think it's been great. Uh, I think it's been huge. I think, one, you know, to each their own, everyone is free to do whatever they want, and there's definitely no cookie-cutter strategy right. for the best training situation. But for me, it was really valuable to be around people who were already in the professional, um, like, arena. Like, yes. they had been to all these races, and they kind of knew how they went, and they understood contracts, and they understood sponsors, and they understood marketing yourself, and... If I had just gone somewhere and trained alone, like I really, I wouldn't be a full professional. I don't think. Like no, I don't I think. Agree. You know, um, you look at someone on our team like like Steph Bruce, who's uber professional. She tries to be professional in everything she does, whether it's marketing or whether it's taking care of her body and whether it's spending the money to go see a doctor when she needs to or getting blood work done. Um, she, she advocates for herself, and right. that's part of being a professional, and that's something you can miss if you, if you don't have a mentor like that. You were actually having a mentor like Josh Cox, yeah. the guy who, when I first started covering him, was really one of the first guys to actively promote himself. Absolutely. Did a phenomenal job on social media before social media really was around. Yeah. And what have you learned from, from Josh in terms of your responsibility as an athlete is is one part of the equation. There's so much more than just running fast. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, Josh was always he's always a businessman. He's right. always been a businessman, and yes. part of being a business, you know, like I was talking about in terms of being a professional, is like in a lot of ways we are all small businesses. And yes, you are. Small businesses need to market themselves. They need a they've got a marketing budget. They've got a marketing team, and uh, there's a lot of people in the sport who don't necessarily uh, either do that or they don't necessarily facilitate other people to do that. Right. And Josh is not one of those people. He's no. all for self-marketing and that makes sense. I mean, he's an agent now and if I do a good job of marketing myself, that's only going to help him to 
um, helped me find partnerships. Like, Absolutely. Like Polar. Polar watches. I'm exactly. wearing Vantage right now. It's an awesome watch. Polar is sponsoring this podcast. And um, Josh being able to negotiate that deal and form this partnership has been awesome for my career. Yes. Um, and it's the same with all my other partners, like Hoka and Goo. Right. And, and speaking of marketing, yeah. are you actually selling your Burrito Mafia shirts? Yeah, so we hit a... Um, <laughs> We did a big pre-order through the team, so the pre-order's over, all the shirts have kind of been sold, but um, if we get enough like uh, interest in another line, we'll, we'll do another, we'll do another, another match. Yeah. And I noticed this whole group of burritos that are sitting behind us here. Oh, yeah. And these are for Whoever. me and you? What are yeah. you doing with these I guys? I mean, how many do you think you can eat, Bob? I think we got, uh, what, about 20? 20, so what, 15 for you, 5 for me? We probably good? <laughs> Uh, we got a few people <laughs> hanging around, so we'll let them go first, and then you and it. I will divvy up the last, the, the rest of them. How Stan, how do you want to give up the burritos? What are you doing? First cup, so we have, at the Polar booth, we have burritos. It's like these are, these came in from or from P Portland. They're flown no. in from Portland. We're gonna, If you're wearing a Polar watch, you come over here. We have a burrito with your name on it, and that includes all the staff. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Stan's like, oh, great. I'm giving away burritos for everybody. Scott, thanks so much for taking time, man. Thanks so much you for having are, me, Bob. Always a pleasure. I love what you bring to the game. I love what you bring to our sport. Love the personality. And more importantly, I love the burritos. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Scott Vobble has been our guest. Everybody, I'm about a round of applause. Professor Scott Vobble, yeah. Burritos for everybody.